The third practice that I have prepared is allow, really allows to test for clustering and in the last part, that was an optional part, really to obtain a surface of the risk of, uh, uh, of being of, of the, in a case control study. So we're going to calculate log risk ratios uh, instead of mode ratios and uh, there is tools to, to obtain a surface of the risk and test for significance. So, um, in the previous uh, presentation and in the previous practice, we have worked mainly with the spatial intensity and we call it first order properties. And we have seen that they are useful tools to describe the distribution of events in our study building. But as we have uh, discussed before, this intensity does not describe whether the points are interacting between them. Exactly, this is the question that you asked me. Is but they are clustered or they are not clustered? Is that they are random or not? And how can we determine that they are clustered uh, or not clustered? They are independent or not independent? And after we can explain why the clustering the clustering occurs. Okay? So the second order property uh, help us to uh, determine whether the, the, the points that we have are clustered, independent, or are really regular distributed in the space. There are two important concepts that look quite, uh, the names are a bit uh, uh, fancy, but are quite easy to understand, is the stationarity and the isotropy of the point process. The stationarity means that wherever region in whatever region you move in the area of interest, the intensity of events is the same. This is so a point pattern, point pattern is stationary when uh, the distribution of uh, the, the points is invariant to translation. So, whatever uh, region you move, the intensity is the same. And is isotropic if the distribution is invariant to rotation. So, if you uh, move the region, or you move in, in one region, you take a different angle, the, the process is the same. In the inhomogeneous uh, process that I showed you before, there was a trend, so it was not uh, invariant to, to, to Francisco, can you repeat isotropic? Isotropic is, uh, is a condition that is filled when the point pattern is invariant to rotation, meaning that if you take this direction, or this direction, or this direction, the intensity is the same. Hmm? Okay. These are two... Yeah. And an arbitrary amount is the size of the... Is the an arbitrary amount is an uh, arbitrary number of events. Oh. Arbitrary num number of events in the plan. So meaning that if we move like this, we have the same intensity here, here, and here. And if we move like this, we have the same intensity here, here, and here. In the first case, we have stationarity. In the second case, we have isotropy. So basically, is that the points are, the intensity is really the same in all parts of our planetary. So this function, this, this formula, determines the function of the second order intensity, uh, well, the it determines the second order intensity function in the, of the point process. Hmm? This means that this function is going to determine the intensity of x considering that, that y exists. Hmm? So, what is the physical interpretation? The physical interpretation of the first order of the intensity is very simple. We discussed before that it's just the expected number of events in the area that we are working. But the second order intensity does not have an easy in physical interpretation. And this is a, a problem. Hmm? Nonetheless, when we have a stationarity and isotropy in our point process, so that we that the intensity does not change for transla translation or rotation, we know that we can obtain another function that is called k function that allows to describe the second order properties of our point pattern. Hmm? This k function 
is just the number of events at a in a in a specific at a specific distance hmm, from an arbitrary event, meaning that a k function is going to determine this is an arbitrary event and it's going to determine the number of events that we have at an arbitrary distance. Okay? And this number of events is going to be, this n number of events is going to be divided by the overall intensity. Okay? This is the overall intensity. So the formula, you see that is lambda minus 1 means divided by multiplied by the number of expected so events. The difference to the kernel function in this case is that now we estimate the number of events around an event while the kernel function estimates the, know, the kernel function probability is around well. each point. They are a bit related, but you, it's, it's not, uh, in, in the kernel you have a, a weighting issue that here is not present. Hmm? But, but here the point in the middle of your circle is an event. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in the kernel as well. But in the kernel, we apply a function to weight them. Here, yes, we count them. Mm -hmm. We have now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 points at a certain distance. And we are going to divide this number of points at a certain distance by the overall intensity. Let's say 5, by five points per square kilometer, or whatever is the, is the overall intensity. Mm -hmm. So. The, the good news is that we can interpret this k function. Hmm? It's more the, the interpretation, the physical interpretation, is easier than the, the second order intensity, and that we have a method to estimate the k function. So basically, the k function speaks about what are the average number of events in a specific distance to an arbitrary event that we correct by the total number of events in the planar region. Okay? We divide by the total number of events in the planar region. So for each arbitrary event, we are going to count the number of events to different distance. For instance, now we have one, two, three, four, five. In a distance of five, okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight events here three events here, and one event here, okay? So the k-function is going to be an average of all the events, the counts of events at different distance, you know? Here is, for instance, for distance five. And we are going to divide this value by the overall intensity. Okay? And the k-function is for each point? No, the k-function is in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm? So in general, we will have, here we will have, for each event, we have seven events. For this event, we have three events. For this event, we have one event for a distance of five. Okay? Do you understand the, the principle? You sum them all up for every event. You sum them all up for every event. Yeah, so basically the k function, I will show you how it looks like. But that's why for the kernel function you need to have an event in the middle of your circles. Because for the kernel function you just want to get the distribution. Exactly. You but for, for the kernel, for the kernel, you are going to, to calculate the kernel, for instance, here. Yeah, exactly. And the k function does not do that. It's for each event, it calculates the number of further events that you have in a specific distance. So you see that the difference is that the k function is calculated from your observed events and try to determine the relation of each event to the neighbors, to the to the other events. Mm. So the k-function speaks about the relationship between these events and the other events, of these events and the other events, of this event and the other events, at different distance. Hmm? <coughs> then the weight is the weighted by distance. And weighted here by yeah, by is by for, for the, the k-function here, it will be calculated for different distance. So at distance 1, you will have a value for the k-function. At distance 2, you will have another value of the k-function. At distance 3... But it's not, it's not weighted. No, no the k-function has weighted. nothing to do with weight. It's not weighted. No. Yes. So basically, for the k-function, you will have something like this. 
and here you have distance. So for the distance y, in average, it's likely here that you are going to have one single event. Huh? So the value will be this one. For a distance 2, for the k-function, most likely you are going to have two events, and so on. Hmm? So the k-function usually looks something like this. You know? In average, for distance 1, you have one event. For distance 2, you have two events, and so on and so forth. Hmm? This value is divided by the overall intensity, for the overall intensity of events. Hmm? So this is divided by lambda. This k function is very interesting. Eh? Why? Because for cluster patterns, we know that one event will be likely surrounded by other points. This is what we call a cluster. Eh? So for a small values of the distance, the closer distance, we'll have k functions that are quite high. So for a cluster pattern, we expect that the k function is high at a small distance. For Regularly spaced patterns, so dispersed points, we expect that there is empty space about the points. Hmm? So we expect that the values of the k-function for a small distance will be quite low. Hmm? Let's define now what is a Poisson process. A Poisson process is a set of events that are completely independent one to another. Okay? They are completely independent. The existence of one point do not influence the existence of another point. So we can define, uh, we have defined before that for this type of process, lambda is the expected number of events per unit area. We have defined it in the, in the previous session. Okay? We know that this is the intensity of events. So if we determine a cycle, Okay, and this is the area of a cycle, P is a square, we know that the expected number of events at a specific distance is this value. Okay? So if in our point pattern we know that the intensity is five cases per square kilometer, hmm? if we determine a radius of one square kilometer, how many events we expect? Five. Five, exactly. Hmm? So, it will be, the expected number of events will be five per square kilometer, and if we have one square kilometer, we'll have five events. Hmm? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So, for different size of the cycle, in a Poisson process, we will have a different number of, expe of expected events. So we know that the k function, <coughs> as I defined it before, the k function. The, the distribution is homogeneous. Hmm? I mean, the, the, uh, the intensity, we, we, we know that depends, I mean, yeah, according to, uh, because it can change around the, the intensity change. Or, uh, but here, no. Here is constant for a point process. So here the points are completely independent one to another. Okay. So in this type of uh, Poisson process where the points are completely independent one to another, we know that lambda is constant. You know, and the expected number of events in a specific distance is given by this value, lambda, lambda multiplied by the area. In this case, the area of a cycle P multiplied by the radius, the square radius. Okay? So I defined before that the expected number of events, this is the expected number of events. Hmm? Well, I have defined before that the k function is the expected number of events divided by the global intensity. So we know that for a Poisson process, the k function will be P multiplied per the radio, the square radio. Uh, the, the, the lambdas you mentioned before with the density, 
they are the same as the lambda for the Poisson process? Yeah. Because the lambda Poisson process, is, is it the expectation value? It's the expectation value. And it just happens to be the same or? Yeah, it's the, the expected number of events per unit area. Yeah. It's a mean. Which is the yeah, it's mean, mean, it's the mean, mean number of, of events. Uh, all the real you, you, you are looking it's for. In the, in the previous example that we considered before was 100 cases per square kilometer. Which and is the density. example that we mentioned yeah. is five cases per, per square kilometer, you know? So let's repeat uh, this one second. So if we have a intensity that is five cases per square kilometer, the expected number of events for a one kilometer distance will be how many? Five. Hmm? Oh, this, is, this is the intensity per the area. We have defined before that the k function is the expected number of events at a given distance divided by the intensity. Hmm? So here the k function will be uh, 5 divided by lambda. We have defined that 5 came from the calculation of lambda multiplied by p by the radius, the square radius. So we can eliminate the lambda, and we know that for a Poisson process, the k function is defined by this function. It's p per the radio, the distance, the square distance. Which is very interesting, because if we know this, we know how it looks like a completely random process, you know? So we can define the function that describes a completely independent uh, Poisson process. Mm -hmm. So this is trying to show the, the this is summarize what I have explained here. So for an homogeneous uh, Poisson process, for an homogeneous Poisson process, the k function is determined or is described by this value p per the square distance. Hmm? So we see in this cycle, for instance, if this is uh, one square kilometer, hmm, that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight events. Okay? When we have a cluster Poisson process, what we observe is that for a small distance, for instance, one square kilometer here, we have a lot of events. The k function is going to be much higher. And for a regular process, we have less number of events. The k-function is going to be much lower. So you understand now that the k-function is very useful to describe whether the point pattern is completely random, whether the point pattern is clustered, or whether the point pattern is a regular uh, process. Hmm? So this is how the k-function looks like. You know? So for a, a specific distance, 0 0.5, the, number, uh, the, the value of the k-function is very small. And as soon as we increase the distance, the k function value uh, increases a lot. For a Poisson process, that is the uh, black line here, we know this function. And as I mentioned before, it's p multiplied by the square uh, radius. Hmm? This is the function that we observe when we, when we have cluster process. Hmm? So there are more events at a small distance. In a regular process, we tend to observe less events in a, in a small distance. Okay? So this value, this, this graph now shows, instead of uh, showing the k-function, we, we have calculated the k-function, but we have uh, subtract the theoretical k-function for a completely random Poisson process. So we expect that if our point pattern follows a independent Poisson process, so it's completely random, the, this difference should be zero. I mean, if our point process is completely random, this and this will be the same. So the difference is expected to be zero. For a cluster process, the difference in the k functions is going to be over, over zero, and the, for a regular process, the difference of the two k functions are going to be under zero. Okay. What is the regular process again? 
is a, some, a process that where the points are more separate one to each other that here some, uh, that what you expect from an independent uh, process. So there, like uh, there, there is uh, deliberately separation from each other. That's the same. Repli repli you say re re not re random repelation in English is uh, replication. No, no, no when well, well, you don't want to be close to another, it's uh, rejection. This rejection? Yeah. When, when the points are repelling, no, the, the points are repelling the other points. So, so, so when they're equally distributed, they are regular. Yeah. Regular, regular. Usually, yeah. usually, in a uh, in a Poisson process, you are going to have random points in the in the in the region. In a regular no, in the in a regular process, you tend to have the points separated yes. by a certain distance. Same amount, so here, for some distance, these points tend to be tend to repel out the, the others. So the, the the empty space around one point is higher than what you would expect following an, a completely independent random process. Hmm? So they're maximally dispersed one from the other. They are dispersed more than what you expect in a completely random uh, distribution of points. So this function is, this case function, as you see, is very useful to determine whether our point process follow uh, a completely random and an independent distribution where the distribution is clustered or where the distribution is uh, regularly spaced. So there is some kind of rejection between the points. So let's go back to uh, cases and controls. That is something that we uh, usually are more used to 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 discuss and to talk about. But at the end, uh, we can create as well case control studies in the space because we will know the location of the cases in a, of a particular disease in a region for in a determined period of time and we will know as well the location of controls in the in this same region okay the issue that we have discussed before is that most of the uh, maps that we create from cases they tend to be clustered but not because there is a real clustering of the cases it's just because the people tend to live in a cluster way. They are areas with higher density of population. So most of the maps that you will get from any disease, the distribution will be clustered by definition. But if the only source of uh, clustering is the, this fact, the density of population, we would expect that this clustering is exactly the same for the control map. Okay. So more formally, we could set up this uh, using a null hypothesis. No? So under the null hypo hypothesis of uh, no spatial clustering, the cases and the controls are independent random samples from the same underlying population. Let's say that if there is no spatial clustering, if you take a random sample uh, of the population, that it will be a control population, will look like the distribution of the controls if there is no clustering. Okay, so we can write this hypothesis using the k-functions. If there is no clustering, the k-function of the cases will look like the k-function of the controls. But I mean, if you are in the, in the reality, you are looking how the people are um, uh, uh, distributed in a special way, in a special place, mm -hmm. like a market. You see the control, and you look for the for the cases, I mean, in a special way, it's really difficult to disentangle. I mean, both. No, because you are, if you are looking in a special no, because you are going to no. the same distribution. If, this, if there is no clustering, if there is no, the only source of clustering is the is the density of population. You are going to observe the same distribution in the cases and in the control. So, you but know. then you miss, you miss what, no, I mean, if you look for a marketplace and you look your cases, how they were distributed in this marketplace, 
And they are. Like what what I mean, do you mean by a marketplace? It's people. Uh, I mean, a, a market where you can have a uh, source of contamination. Yeah. I mean, more, more your area of uh, to, to look for the distribution is, 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 is uh, clo uh, small. Mm -hmm. More it's difficult to disentangle the distribution. I mean, still you need. Yeah, I mean, it was obvious <laughs> in this. In this uh, here, that a very, a very small, very small distance, distance is, is not possible. So there is a minimum distance where you can set up a real cluster. So we can we can we can test this this null hypothesis that the k functions of cases and controls are equal, or even this one. Eh? We can calculate the difference in the k functions, and we can say that establish the null hypothesis that this distance is equal to zero. You know? If these two are equal, we could set up the null hypothesis that the difference in the k functions is equal to zero. And we can test this uh, null hypothesis using a normal approximation or using Monte Carlo uh, techniques. Okay? So if we come back to the first example that I, I showed you at the beginning, we have these two maps. You know? We have these leukemia cases that really look like clusters. If you take just this map, what, do, what would you say? That the cases are clustered or not? We don't know. Here. Looks like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah, they are clustered. Yeah, yeah, they are clustered. Yeah. Yeah. They are clustered. And they are not, fo they are not followed. Uh, they will be different than a uh, completely independent Poisson process. They are aggregated. But the source of aggregation can be just the density of population. So if we look at the distribution of controls, you see that the map is not so different. The cases and the controls follow a very similar clustering, cluster distribution. But the source of the clustering, of the clustering is just the density of population. And this example, the controls were randomly selected. Were randomly selected, exactly. So if we calculate the difference in the k functions, it seems that the cases could have even a higher uh, probability to be clusters, clustered than the controls, but we cannot reject the null hypothesis that they are equal. Indeed, the p-value was 0 0.14, meaning that the source of clustering was not nothing real in the space, was just that people were living closer one to another. Hi, Christina. Hi. 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 Sorry? It has nothing to do with I, I hope so, I hope so, because I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> so, so here, we were testing the, the, the null hypothesis that the k function here and the k function here were equal. In, instead of just comparing, we, we calculate the difference in, the, in both k functions. And we said, if they are equal, it should be zero. Sorry, Francisco. Then the risk of being sick of leukemia is the same if I, I live up to the map or uh, in the same. Exactly. The risk is, uh, is the same. Is the same. There, is the there is not an area. There is not an area where there is higher risk okay. of uh, suffering from leukemia. Okay. So this graph shows the difference in the k functions of cases and controls. Okay. We expect for a that the, the difference is around zero. In this case, the difference is indeed a bit higher than, than zero. But using a Monte Carlo uh, test, we were not able to say that statistically it differed from zero. Okay? This is within the 95% confidence intervals. And indeed, if we calculate the overall test, the p-value was 0 0.14 for the uh, using the Monte Carlo test and 0 0.11 in <coughs> the normal approximation. So the, the conclusion here is that yes, our cases are clustered, but they are clustered just because the density of population. So the cases and the controls 
do not differ in the level of, of clustering. Um, could you make the last slide again, please? So let's just assume, I, I don't know whether I'm, I understood it fully. If I were to cheat on the results, I would take the distance where the k function is slightly above the top boundary of the significance, isn't it? Like the first step where it goes up. Mm. There it is just one notch above mm. the significant. Okay. And this distance would actually be, would, would tell me there is a significant... Um, no, no, it's not. You, you, because you, don't get, you, you don't get the 0 0.05. It's true that you can try to change your results if you want, but... Uh, would be a bit like an interim so but the k function of the x-axis is, is a distance, isn't it? Yeah. The, so, so the I distance of the points from each other. So if I would take that distance where it is above the, the, the limit... Yeah, but it's really slowed above the meaning. Is but yeah, in overall, if you consider the, the whole k function, there is no difference. Uh, yes, but w w what I meant is when um, <laughs> if I don't think, if you choose another yeah, buffer, yeah. this particular distance, or let's say even better, this distance, and if I ask the question now whether there is a, um, a um, an association between the leukemia cases measured at that particular distance, I would get a significant result, wouldn't I? Yeah, no, but the k-function needs to be calculated from zero to a certain distance. Mm -hmm. So all these values are calculated. You cannot take pick just one value. Mm -hmm. The test is not set up to pick up <coughs> a single value. It's, okay. It provides an overall test for your okay. for distribution. Okay. 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 There are some rules to determine the the distance where you need to test uh, uh, for statistical significance. It's true that at the end it's a visual test and somebody could argue that for a specific distance it could be or is in the limit of the statistical significance that there is a possible difference in the in, in the risk of being a case. You know? So one could say that it could be that there is a certain a certain amount of clustering. Florian? Yeah. I'm trying to respond to your yeah. question. So so here it's true that you could argue that for these values it could be that there is a certain level of, of clustering. Overall, the distribution, if you take the overall picture, the distribution is not different for cases and control. Okay. This is an, an adjust analysis. I think you need to adjust for other confounders in order to check whether there is clustering. And you will have results like this one, where it's very difficult to say whether there is a real clustering or not. Okay? If you select just certain distance, as you were saying, up to here, and not take the whole distance of your of your polygon area. Okay. Uh, can this graph uh, give us the distance at which there is a certain cluster? Yeah, exactly. If, if there is a, really a, an, an area that exceeds yeah. the, the envelope, you will interpret that at this distance there is Okay, so the, okay, the x is the, the, the distance. distance in meters? In, 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 if you have meters, it will be meters. Okay. Okay. It's just because leukemia is a really rare disease. Mm -hmm. Then in a way, it's a, a, bit, a bit in contradiction with the disease and uh, the fact that the, there is nothing that is, could be linked. You know what I mean? The, but here, the only thing that you say is, is that, you know that there, is no, uh, there is no clustering, is that you cannot reject the null hypothesis that both are equally distributed. Probably, if you increase the number of cases in your sample, or the number of controls, yeah, yeah. this difference that you cannot establish here, probably a real difference, yeah. you know? But the important thing to take in mind is that most of the, of the, of the point patterns that you will observe in, in, in epidemiology, they will be clustered in somehow just because of the density of population. So if you want to... Uh, argue that there is clustering coming from a second source, for instance, an incinerator or a cooling tower, you need to prove that the clustering is not due to the normal distribution of the density of population, is because there is extra clustering in this place. Yeah. Usually, this distance is calculated for the half of the polygon 
that, that you have, you know? So you have your polygon and the maximum distance will be half of the size of, of your polygons. So actually, you, are, you understand very easily that if you vary the size of the polygon, the overall p-value can be modified. But in principle, you, you should try to obtain, I mean, you are seeking for real, for the truth. I mean, I I'm, I'm presume that you are not doing a, a test just for cheating. <laughs> so you are interested. So in this case, it's very silly because you are cheating to yourself. It's like, <laughs> I feel like it's necessary. But I mean, when you run a, a, a statistical test, <coughs> you, you want to find the truth. If you force the reality to be another, you are not cheating anybody, you are cheating to yourself. You know? Is that you are trying to see something that obviously is not there. So there is, there is, this is complex when you analyze uh, spatial data because you need to make choices that can affect the results and you need to do the best choices in order to get results that represent the truth. I think that this is a very This one is only looking at cases relationship one to the other, not with particular types. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is only going to, to tell you whether there is overall clustering in, in, in the distribution of cases that exceed what you would expect considering the normal density of population. Then we should say that the keys are, are um, gathered or um, aggregate, but they are not clustered. Exactly. Okay. They, are not, they are clustered, but not, no more, clustered. not more than the controls. So okay. They are clustered in the but same way clustered. that the race. There is no extra clustering, I would okay. say. There is no clustering coming from another uh, it's clear, but you probably have observed more cases than you would expect it in nearby the um, point you were measuring. Exactly, there was an excess risk, but that was not significant. In this, in this case, but uh, in, in, other, case, in other, in other, in other uh, studies, is so obvious that the cases exceed yeah, yeah. the density of population. Due that uh, I mean, we will use the. The, the data that we were using before, and you will see that the cases are much more clustered than uh, the, the, the distribution of the controls. Okay? So, uh, for instance, we use this method in a cholera outbreak in Guinea-Bissau. So, we look in a specific neighbor where there was uh, a lot of cases, and we plot uh, the coordinates of the cases, and we compare with the distribution of the controls a random sample from the population. And it was really obvious that there was clustering and we identified two places where the clustering was really high. It was around one market and uh, one intersection of the streets where there was a lot of waste. You know? So, I mean, this was really useful to detect that there was really something that exceeds exceed what you'd expect to, coming from the natural distribution of the population and uh, to put in place uh, measures to try to decrease the, the infection, uh, the risk of infection. Did you do this with this model? Yeah, we did a model. Can I check something with you as well again? Uh, you know the concentric circles? Yeah. So this is not cumulative. This is the occurrence of cases within this band or ring. Yeah, in average. And, uh, sorry? Yeah, in average. An average, within that ring. But it does not take account of the previous events rings. that have occurred in the rings mm. closer to the mm. center. For each distance, it's calculate uh, independent value. So questions? So you see that, I mean, it's not, it's not so easy. Hmm? It's not so difficult, Mina, I think. Let me call you. The thing, you know, no, the, the thing is that there is very new concepts. There are a lot of new concepts, because you need to understand what is a, a completely random Poisson process. Once that you have understand what is a random Poisson process, you need to understand that there is a point pattern that it will tend to be clustered. And after, when you are able to identify cluster patterns, you need to understand whether this cluster is just natural, in the sense that is the normal distribution of the population, or there is extra clustering due to a, a, second, a second source. It's true that the majority of the time in epidemiology you never um, really heard in a daily way these things, you know, mm -hmm. of intensity, density. Yeah. So this is because we are trying to introduce these concepts yeah. here. So I will 
want you just to have a quick look to the third practice. I want to do it quickly, eh? very quickly. 